you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks to Ika and Cambridge Art Galleries for the invitation to speak with you this evening. Um, the artist talk tonight will be a little bit different in that some of the images, or most of the images, won't be of my artwork. Um, I will show you some of my work, but largely the images will be research, research pictures uh, to give you some context um, uh, into my practice and the things that I think about when I'm making my work. So I want to start off with uh, this quote by Erin Manning. And Erin Manning, she is a scholar out of Concordia University, and um, she says, artfulness is always more than human. And what she means by that is when art enters into the world, so it enters into a gallery space um, or into the public realm, it starts to interact with other artworks, uh, with the viewer, with architecture, um, even the political uh, situation at that time. Um, and it begins to develop kind of its, its own life. It starts to behave um, and interact with the things around it in this kind of unexpected way, and in a way it has its kind of own being. Uh, and so for Manning, artfulness is more than human because it happens outside of what the artist um, has expected for it, out of, outside of the artist's intentions. And I think this um, idea of the kind of the power that art can have would be quite readily uh, accepted by another artist that I look up to. Her name is uh, Tricia Donnelly. And she's a San Franciscan-based artist. I think she's now currently living in um, New York. And uh, Donnelly, she's well known for kind of oscillating between different media. So drawing, sculpture, video, sound, installation, uh, kind of all, all of the above. Uh, but what's unusual about her practice is that she very rarely will kind of prescribe language to her work. So she will have shows and artwork that are often untitled, and she will very rarely speak directly about her work. So even in an artist talk, she's not really speaking about her work. Um, she'll kind of speak about things around the work. And of course, this makes it hard for, say, art critics, who, you know, they want to write about the work, but they're having to read, they're having to read her shows cold. And so this happened to one, um, one critic in particular. His name is uh, Julian Myers. And he encountered this work uh, at a show in New York. And it's a diptych. So rather than being shown side by side, like you see here, it's one drawing on one side of the drywall, and then the other on the other. So like the drywall is kind of sandwiched in between. And you can see these are really kind of, they're very, um, they're abstract, they're hard to read at first glance. And so this uh, critic, Julian Myers, he was kind of fishing for clues, trying to find like an entry point into the work. So he asked the gallery attendant, you know, how, how are these drawings adhered to the wall? And the attendant said, well, they're pinned. Because if they had been framed, they wouldn't be able to move through the wall. So here, you know, Donnelly's suggesting that her artwork is autokinetic, okay? It can move on its own. And in fact, when you, look at, when you look at the two, the one kind of looks like, you could imagine it has kind of telescoped its way through the drywall and made kind of a faint ghostly impression of itself onto another piece of paper. Um, she's gone even further, and she's, she's suggested that she doesn't even make her artwork at all. She's described the um, act of drawing as like a mechanical task that's been assigned to her. Um, and this all kind of sounds preposterous, like how is it that you don't make your own artwork? But what if an artwork could make itself? What would that look like? Um, and is there, is there a sentience or even a creativity in kind of like in non-human objects? And so I'm interested in situating my own practice within different systems of knowledge where um, my human-centered intentions are not at the, kind of, they're not the most important part of the, of the work. Um, and so I want, to, I want to kind of consider a place where we could start to imagine viewpoints of different objects. And what would, you know, taking it out of the studio, what would our world look like if we could, in fact, envision um, a reality uh, that's encountered by objects like knives, rocks, 
uh, trees, what would happen? So I want to take you to a number of places uh, this evening to kind of discuss this diff these different kinds of meaning making, the different ways we can understand the world around us. So the next place I'd like to go is ancient Greece. This is um, an image of a lodestone. And it's a, it's a magnetic mineral. And ancient Greek philosophers were really intrigued by lodestone because it was able to move pieces of metal around. So in this photograph, you can see that iron nails are attracted to lodestone. Um, and for Greek philosophers, so there's the philosopher and mathematician named Thales. Um, he believed lodestone was alive because it had the capacity to move the things around it, move metal around it. He was also the first to notice that um, amber, when it was um, rubbed against fur, it was capable of attracting things like leaves, um, feathers to it. And for him, that meant that amber was alive. So he's what you call a hylozoist. He thinks that matter is alive. Um, and you know, you can do this, you can kind of play around with amber on your own as well. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty kind of rare, um, a rare kind of precious stone, and it's quite expensive. Uh, it's getting to be more and more expensive. So if you're hunting around for one of these things, you can wear, um, you can wear a wool sweater to a flea market. And if you see a suspected piece of amber, then you rub it against your sleeve, and if you find that your hair is attracted to it, it's the real thing. And if you don't have that attraction, then it's likely a piece of imitation plastic. So that's Thales. Thales kind of discovered that for us. Uh, so I want to take you, yes, um, to more places later on in this lecture. I'm going to discuss places uh, like in medieval Europe, where these kinds of ideas, the life of objects, um, those are also readily accepted. Um, and I also wanted to say about, about Lodestone and Thales, um, I'm imagining, you know, Trisha Donnelly and her drawings moving through a wall and how that maybe to us that sounds kind of bizarre, but if we were to describe that action to him, he might not even bat an eyelash, right? So I'm curious about um, things that seem impossible here and now and how they might quite, quite well be readily accepted within a different context. So before I move on to medieval Europe and, and some other places, I'll show you some of my own artwork. Um, I did a residency in 2010 in northeastern Poland, and that was in a city called Białystok. And I was there for two months with five uh, international artists, and we were offered this military warehouse as a studio space. And I wanted to try something new with this residency. I wanted to put some kind of limitations on my practice. So I decided that I would not bring any artist materials with me. Um, I just kind of showed up and uh, decided to make whatever I, whatever I could with the things that I had at hand. So around this military warehouse, there were a lot of stones, um, pieces of concrete, and a lot of recycled paper lying around. And so I thought, what if these stones, what if they were, um, they, they had the ability to grow? What would that look like? So I would wind um, strips of fabric over kind of the central form of a rock, and each strip would kind of follow the next. In, the, in this way, the form was kind of extending itself. And because it was paper mache, it, the strips would kind of get heavy under their own weight and sort of buckle over. And so to keep them upright, I, I propped other rocks um, underneath them. And you know, after looking at them in this space in particular, it occurred to me that they, they kind of had a canon-like feel to them. So I think I was being influenced by my surroundings without kind of intentionally trying to reference the military uh, warehouse. So that was in 2010. Uh, and in 2012, I started my MFA. And, you know, I was quite nervous to kind of bring any, any sort of materials into my studio space because I knew that would determine what kind of artist I would become. And I didn't know what I wanted that to be. So the studio sat empty for a little while. And eventually I decided to treat my MFA as like a two-year-long artist residency. 
just to kind of break the ice. I was like, okay, you know, just go down to the river. I did my MFA at Western, so I had the, um, the Thames River right outside of the studio. And so I walked down there and grabbed these two stones and uh, balanced them on top of one another. And because they, they wouldn't stay that way, I paper mache them in place. So the black part is paper mache covered with charcoal. So it's sort of like this kind of, um, it's like a structural shadow. Um, and I'm in a way kind of holding them against their will, um, which I, know, I don't know how I feel about that. So fragility and, um, the, and precarity, those were constants within my MFA. And I, and I think having some time now to look back at that period of, of um, production, I think I was intrigued by this precariousness because it was like the closest thing I could get to um, kind of objects asserting their own willfulness. So there was a possibility if I balanced some things um, on top of one another and didn't paper mache them, closed the door, came back, they could have toppled over perhaps, they maybe did move when I wasn't looking. And so it was kind of like this very, very quiet and passive way of letting materials um, perhaps assert their willfulness against my expectations. Uh, and so up until this point, I'm dealing a lot with uh, kind of archetypal tools. So I'm looking at rocks, wooden wedges, um, bows and arrows, cannons, things like that, and that eventually starts to, to morph into an interest in netting. Uh, and netting, it's really, it's become a reoccurring icon for me. Uh, and you know, it's, it's one of those objects that it has, it has so many associations. So you know, you think of camouflage, you think of hunting. Um, it's like a semi-permeable membrane, right? So it can hold things in, but it can also selectively let things through it. Uh, it's also a kind of a matrix of, of connections that uh, can grow and grow and grow. So it's like this, it has this kind of infinity value to it. But there's more than, than just those things. And uh, I set out for the last maybe year and a half or so to really look at, in a more focused way at nets um, to try to understand uh, more deeply the context in which they exist. Uh, and so that's where a Chalmers Arts Fellowship comes in. Um, and that's administered through the Ontario Arts Council. And because of that grant, I was able to travel to different locations and research different instances of netting across different time periods and locations. And so some of this lecture, I'll be walking you through um, this research. Some more images uh, from my MFA. Uh, so this is like a, a faux wood grain pattern on a piece of mylar that I've, I've painted and then I've cut out a net, net shaped pattern using an X-Acto knife. And so um, I would, you'll notice that faux wood grain will come up a fair bit in some of the other images I'm going to show you. And I think it's like a wooden net is sort of this impossible thing, right? Like the qualities of wood don't really lend themselves to the kind of fluidity of mesh. And so because of that impossibility, I, I find myself kind of attracted to it. Um, and wood, of course, has some pretty fabulous qualities. So, you know, it can expand and contract depending on the humidity, the temperature. So it is able to move on its own. Um, it also has a chemical potential to it, right? Like it, it can drastically alter its surroundings because it can fuel a fire. It could also transform into charcoal. It can, it can like transmutate into um, petrified stone over time. So I think it's because it has this capability of really transforming itself into different states, different kind of ways of being, that I'm so attracted to it because it seems so uh, powerful, so unusual, the things that it can do. So this is uh, my first solo exhibition after finishing my MFA, and it was at the University of Waterloo um, Art Gallery, curated by Ivan Jurakic, and this was kind of like a <coughs> kind of a moment to be free because I was able to produce for the first time since my MFA without worrying about that kind of um, inevitable critique that was going to happen. Um, and so I want to take you through a few images of the show to give you a sense of what I was thinking about here. 
Uh, I really wanted there to be a relationship between the works. I wanted there to be a sense of energy between the works. Um, I use one tool, or sorry, one artwork as a tool to create another artwork. So in this way, the works, they kind of share a genetic code. Uh, there, there are also a lot of repeating patterns and um, shadows that help to you know, formally unify the, the exhibition. And here, abstraction is really important to me. Um, you know, like you don't, you're not quite sure what you're looking at. You can ascribe some language to it, like, is that a hurdle? Is that a drying rack? Maybe this is a figure. You know, you're not quite sure what you're looking at, though. And I think, you know, abstraction is important in that it, it kind of keeps meaning and knowledge in flux. If you can't confidently put a name to something, uh, you can't really, in my mind, really fully know it. And that's exciting because the knowledge is, is, is circling. You can't put a finger, like a firm finger on that thing. Um, and then all of a sudden, things seem more possible. So these ideas that I'm talking about, like with Trisha Donnelly's drawings, they move through a wall, or Thales believing in the life of objects, I think those ideas are really perfectly explored through abstraction because we, we're in a state of unknowing um, and all of a sudden the impossible, we can start to speculate. You know, anything can happen. So abstraction is my friend in this situation. And I saw this piece on the floor as kind of the, um, a threshold or a barrier that you needed to cross in order to get to the rest of the show. And so uh, it is made out of an industrial type of material. It's faux leather, uh, so it's pleather. And it's that material that you would see like um, over a bench in a diner or something. And the underside of it, it's, it's, a piece, it's kind of fabric-y. And so I'm able to treat it like uh, a canvas. And so I just sew the underside and then I paint it with acrylic to appear like a faux wood grain pattern. Um, and then I slice, I slice the work. And slicing allows me to show both sides simultaneously so you can see the faux leather and the faux wood at the same time. And it's draped precariously over this kind of um, this dowel and um, twine spools. And so it is, it's able to be tipped over. And I think it got tipped over once, but Ivan hid that for me, I think, very, very well. And I didn't quite notice. Um, more work in the show. So the sculpture on the left was my attempt at making a net without using the image of a net. So I was imagining you know, the qualities that I'm attracted to in netting and how can I replicate that without um, using its image. And so it's air-dried clay in three parts, and that's been hung on a steel armature that's jutting out of the wall. So you can see there are holes, gaps in which you can peer uh, through um, shadows, you know, so things that you would find with, with a net. And on the right-hand side is, is a piece that was shown here at Cambridge Galleries that Ega curated last year, um, a group show. Um, and it's the same material as that floor piece. So again, painted to look like wood grain inside, sliced, and then hung to kind of like sag under its own weight. And this is another kind of net-like work. Uh, so it's made of uh, unfired clay, and it's kind of like a chain that's on a drying rack. Um, and it's quite fragile, right, because it's unfired, so it's, it's possible for it to break. Uh, it's not set in stone. Uh, and it was important for me to include work that was a little bit more handmade in this exhibition because I felt that a lot of the other work, it seemed almost mechanically produced. It, you know, using, I was using industrial materials, uh, the slicing was pretty accurate, um, and I was concerned that if I just had work like that in the show, the reading would be quite simple, or it could be simple if you didn't want to spend time in the show. You could walk in and say, okay, I get this. This is about you know, formal abstraction or post-minimalism. And, and I, wanted, I wanted there to be a different conversation. So by having things that were a little bit more handmade, a little bit um, unfinished, I, I was hoping the conversation would become more about the relationship between 
this kind of material and that kind of material? Or why are these things beside each other? Or how, do, how does this pattern relate to that, um, the specific qualities of, of vinyl? Like more about relationships rather than just about um, the canon, which is fine, it's just not what I was going for with that particular show. Okay, so I want to go back now to kind of the power of minerals. So going back to, um, you know, Thales, um, let's think about some other people who are interested in, in the power of minerals. Um, this is a piece of cinnabar, and I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, so in medieval Europe, uh, there are people like uh, Thomas Aquinas, um, Albertus Magnus, and they're believing in the healing properties of minerals. And for them, stones, rocks, they, they have morals. They're mortal. Uh, they are even gendered. And their kind of like most conspicuous of activities is their uh, kind of capacity to heal. So they're able to, say, cure infertile land and make it grow again or these rocks are able to cure human ailments. So cinnabar was ingested to cure leprosy, but it was also used to get one to a higher plane of existence. Um, so in, uh, you know, in alchemy, it was very important because there, there's actually a, a high mercury content in cinnabar, and they called that quicksilver. And so in ancient China, um, alchemists would consume the cinnabar uh, to get to a higher plane of existence, and they died. Uh, so this is, it's a very revered uh, ingredient in alchemy because of its power. Uh, a little bit more about alchemy. So Isaac Newton, we know him for his kind of conventional research, scientific research, right? But he was also secretly very busy with alchemy. And he kept this, he kept this under wraps because it was considered blasphemous. So with alchemy, you're, you're trying to obtain something called the philosopher's stone. So you're able to remove kind of the impurities from metals um, in order to create gold but you're also obtaining eternal life. So that's kind of the philosopher's stone. Uh, and of course, you're messing with natural processes. You're playing with God. And so that's why this was considered, or you're, you're, you're like acting like God, right? And it is considered blasphemous uh, for that reason. And so one example of this kind of messing with natural processes is something called uh, mineral uh, vegetation. Um, and, you know, we think of alchemy as being something that's kind of in the past, but it's actually occurring in present day. There is um, a researcher out of Indiana University, his name is William Newman, and he's one of the leading scholars on Isaac Newton's alchemy. And he's actually deciphered a number of uh, Newton's Isaac Newton's recipes and recreated them. And this is one such, one such recreation, and I'd like to show you uh, a little bit of that. So for Newton, he's observing uh, metals growing, multiplying in a flask. And so to him, this means that uh, this metal is alive. And so he's, you know, he's considered to be manipulating materials. Um, and I think in a way there is a parallel between artistic production and this kind of alchemy. At least for me, what I'm thinking about is the way that I control the materials that I work with in the studio. And I think we all as artists, you know, we're, we're manipulating the things that we work with um, and altering them. Like, for example, me kind of keeping stones together forever when, when they don't really want to be. It's that kind of control over materials that I, I'm uncomfortable with and that I'm feeling a little bit at odds with. Um, This 
pretty neat. <laughs> Just make sure if I'm good. Okay. Okay, this is an example of one of Isaac Newton's recipes. And it's from a very large manuscript that is, it was very secret for a long time. Um, and this recipe is of particular interest to me. It's called the net. And this is what got me interested in alchemy. And so, these recipes, these alchemical recipes, they're all written in code language because we want to keep things secret, right? We want to make sure that no one knows that we're, we're playing around with chemicals and we're um, trying to produce artificial life. Uh, and so to keep things secret, they're written in this code language. Um, this one in particular is written in English Latin, but also um, in a Roman myth. So there's a narrative aspect to the recipe. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about this myth, uh, and that will explain why it's called the net. So here what's written is the myth of um, Mars and Venus. So Mars, she's married to Vulcan, but she's having an affair, uh, oh sorry, other way around. Venus is married to Vulcan. She's having an affair with Mars. And so Vulcan finds out about this, and he decides to forge a almost invisible bronze net. <coughs> and he waits to find his wife and Mars together, and he throws this bronze net over them to ensnare them, and then kind of show them to the public, show, kind of expose their infidelity. So what you need to know, that in alchemy, uh, planets, they stand in for elements. So Mars and Venus, that's, that's actually um, iron and copper. And so when Newton's writing about this myth and he's talking about Mars and Venus being together, what he's saying is you must melt iron and copper and mix them together. And then you're going to achieve this net, which is a copper alloy that has a net-like pattern running through its surface. And so there's an interesting narrative thing ha happening here, right? And it makes me think about Donnelly's practice where there's a lot of storytelling, there's this mythologizing that's happening around her practice. And in both instances, it's a way of kind of keeping processes secret. Um, so what's really exciting is that uh, William Newman in Indiana, he's taken the time to decipher this and recreated it. Uh, and so he's recreated the net and it looks like this. And I set out on a mission to go see this for myself. Uh, I was all ready to jump into my car, drive out to Indiana, um, because I wanted to see the net-like patterning uh, with my own eyes. But unfortunately, I wasn't granted that permission to go see it in person. And so this image is from um, the Indiana University website. And so not being able to see this object, it, I had to change my whole course of research. So. I decided instead, rather than fixating on this one alchemical recipe, I decided to look at alchemy as a whole and how it might relate to artistic creative processes. And so I found out about a conference and an exhibition that was happening at the Getty in Los Angeles. And it's an exhibition all about um, alchemy as it relates to art. And then the conference was also about that. And so I went out there. And I got to, I went to the Getty and saw this exhibition and saw the cinnabar and I got to see a number of manuscripts, different objects related to alchemical experimentation. And while I wasn't able to see that reconstruction of the net in Indiana, I was offered a really awesome consolation prize. Um, I was walking around the very dim museum and I came across this small, small painting by Joachim Vatavel, and it's titled Mars and Venus Surprised by Vulcan. I was like, whoa, hold on. I totally recognize this name. I know what this is. Um, and I'm scouring the picture for Vulcan because I know he's going to be holding a near uh, invisible net, right? And so I'm squinting, squinting. I think I find Vulcan, and this is the best I could do. So I got this picture of his like hands gripping this this block. I don't know what it is, but imagine this tinselly, beautiful net. So it's very elusive, you see. 
Um, and so you'll remember Mars and Venus, right? They stand in for iron and copper. Well, this painting is oil paint on a thin sheet of copper. So it actually has the very ingredients um, from that recipe in its construction. So while I wasn't in Indiana looking in that reconstruction of the net, I felt like I was looking at a version of it, like I was kind of in LA and at Indi in, in Indiana looking at that object, but it was kind of presenting itself to me in a pictorial form, right? So it was, it was, really, it was a really great kind of feeling of connection. Um, I kind of felt like things had cosmically aligned themselves. I had, had witnessed the net and uh, I kind of felt like a holistic detective. Um, and so accompanying this exhibition was a conference. It was a day long conference and there were a number of uh, scholars from around the world that presented on their particular research into art and alchemy. And this is Stephen Little, who's a curator at the LA County Museum of Art. And he's presenting on uh, Taoism and alchemy. And he had us all kind of like jaw dropped because he's describing things like mountains that are pure energy. He's saying, you know, that there are caves where time moves backwards. He's describing gourds that um, kind of reveal parallel universes. And a lot of these ideas are attributed to Taoism, which is like a way of life. Um, it's a religion that, that, that says that all life and, and kind of matter stems from nothingness. And it's here, um, we're talking, I, I think it's like five, it's um, 500 BC, so ancient China. This is where alchemists are consuming their cinnabar to kind of achieve um, that higher plane of existence. So we're learning more about transmutation of form, transmutation of base metals into gold, transmuting mortals into immortals. And it's that kind of transmutation that leads me into this next piece. And it's by Anne Whitlock. And it shows, um, it shows the transformation of steel into rust. So last year, I was invited to be part of an exhibition at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery and this was curated by uh, Crystal Mari, and it was a group show. Um, what happened was Crystal invited local artists to uh, scour their permanent collection, which is vast and fantastic, um, and we were to choose something from the collection that we wished to respond to. So I fell for the Anne Whitlock. Um, she's based in Paris, Ontario, and what she did was she laid out steel wool onto the floor and sprayed it with water and waited for that oxidization to happen. And she was so taken by that, um, the transmutation that she wanted to kind of keep it there forever. So she poured latex all over it. And uh, the color that you're seeing here is just from the rust. And it's transparent in some areas and you can see kind of the weight of it. It's very, this, it's kind of this heavy rubbery thing. And so it reminded me of a curtain. And so in, um, in response, I created my, my own curtain of sorts, so it's um, acrylic paint on that faux, on that pleather. And the way I sliced it, when you um, kind of splay it apart on the wall, it creates this net-like pattern. And then I have a second piece on the floor there. When we took the Ann Whitlock out of storage, we weren't sure whether it was supposed to be shown on the wall or on the floor, because it had never been exhibited before. And I was really intrigued by that kind of confusion of states. And I wanted to create something that was also, didn't quite know what it was just yet. So with this floor piece, it could perhaps be a curtain that is migrating to the floor or vice versa. And it's also, it's the same kind of process, right? So faux wood grain painted on that faux leather. And then it's, um, it's kind of juxtaposed with the, the real wood, so the, the pole and the beams, those are real wood, and then we've got the faux, the faux wood patterning that's happening on the, on the leather, on the faux leather. This is, um, this is an exhibition uh, about nine months ago now at Olga Korper Gallery, which is a commercial space in Toronto. And the long line of drawings that you see, uh, they are net drawings, so I made them by tracing a physical net that I hand knotted. And 
as you move from left to right, the net becomes more and more visible. So the first, the first one in line was also shown here at Cambridge Galleries. It's barely visible. Uh, and as you move through, the net starts to emerge a little bit more. And so I'm adding color into the background and the net is starting to come out. Um, and I, you know, I started, once I finished the series of drawings, it occurred to me that perhaps I was moving from the immaterial into the more material. So they started to kind of form out of a type of fog in my mind. And here is a detail of that last one just to show you the line quality. So it's this transfer paper. It's kind of like a carbon paper, but it's white. Um, and then there's some color added in there. And here's another detail of, a, of another one. So I'd like to uh, now switch back to that conference in LA. And I learned there about the Mutus Liber, which is, um, it's Latin for silent book. And it's a very well-known book in the world of alchemy because it's filled with uh, riddles, secrets, and beautiful illustrations all about alchemical processes. So this plate in particular is showing the collection of celestial dew. So in the middle ground, you'll notice that there are these structures that are four posts with fabric stretched across them. And they're left out overnight, and so dew will collect on them. And then in the morning, these individuals wring out that celestial dew into a bowl underneath. And that water is then used as an ingredient in an alchemical recipe. And so it's this kind of, um, this kind of collection of something from nothing, or this um, manifestation from thin air that that brings me to um, another part of my research, the Chalmers Fellowship research, where I traveled to central Chile to observe the fog catching nets there. And so these, these large nets, they're a fine plastic mesh. They're used in parts of the world that have little rainfall, but a lot of fog. So places like Nepal, Guatemala, um, Ethiopia, the place that I visited was in central Chile called um, Pina Blanca. And it was, these nets are situated on a nature reserve uh, that is about 6,000 acres. And it's been cared for by the people that live in Pina Blanca for the past 400 years. And so you might know that the driest place on earth is the Atacama Desert, and that's in the northern part of the country. Um, but that desert is slowly starting to move its way down the country because uh, very little rainfall the last couple of decades. And the water scarcity is also um, <coughs> is exacerbated by the copper mining industry. So copper mining is really big out there. Um, the, the groundwater, the rivers, parts of the Pacific Ocean, they're privatized in Chile. And that makes it easy for industries like uh, the copper mining industry to use up a lot of water, which they need. They really need that for their processes. And then what happens is a lot of these toxic chemicals from that mining process, they get dumped back into the Pacific Ocean, which then uh, travels down the coast. And so there are coastal fishing villages that are severely compromised because of this. So there's a village uh, by the name of Chanaral and uh, used to be a vibrant fishing village, but because of the pollution, they can't do that anymore. So they use these fog catching nets there uh, in this kind of perverse, like reversal of logic, right? Where they're, they're trapping the mist. I'll explain the process of fog catching nets in a, in a second, but they, they capture the mist um, which collects water, and then they use that water for fish farming on the land because they can't do it in the ocean anymore. Okay, so I want to show you this video here on the top of this mountain, and this is a way of, um, it shows you kind of the amount of fog that you need in order for the fog catching nets to work. So it's very dense, you can see it's um, kind of like a thick smoke, 
and uh, it was very, very windy. And you have to have that combination of wind and the fog density in order for the nets to work. And so we were there on a, on a really foggy day, super lucky, because sometimes there, it's not that foggy and you can see past the side of the mountain quite far. I've seen pictures and, and it's a beautiful view, but we, that's as far as we could see on that day. It was really amazing to walk through that fog. And then this is the, a close-up of the net. And so you can see the, the fog is pushing through and then the water droplets, you'll notice them kind of dropping down the bottom of that structure and into this trough. And then um, those troughs, they empty into cisterns, which I'll show you in a second. Um, they, empty, they empty into cisterns that have spigots on them. And so you can control the water that you've captured. And so for each a square meter of netting, um, you can capture six liters of water a day. That's on average. And these are the cisterns. And so the water in this particular area, it's used for drinking water for livestock. And it's also used, a very important thing, it's used to water the native vegetation there. And so what's happening is um, this area, they were noticing that a lot of their native vegetation was dying. And because of that, the root systems uh, they die off, right? And then the soil quality worsens because there are no roots that are kind of holding the soil together. And so when that wind comes in, erosion, it's very easy for erosion to happen. And so, you know, you're slowly starting to see your landscape blow away, right? And so for the last 11, I guess 12 years now, um, they've been using this system here in Pina Blanca and you can see that they've revived their natural vegetation. So they've taken a really bad situation and, and turned it around. Um, they've taken control of this, of this uh, desertification that's starting to come in, but in different time periods, in different places, it's become this kind of matrix of, of potential. Um, and so there are a number of different kinds of nets. This is uh, one that's, that's really great for a certain kind of fog droplet, but not so great for other kinds. So fog droplets change from day to day. And so it's important for these locations to have a variety of different netting to maximize their yield. And it's quite peculiar, right, that a droplet would be different, but this particular, um, this mesh is really great for a certain kind, and you'll notice this mesh is a completely different pattern. And so when I was there, I saw these sculptures, or I saw these nets as, as abstract sculptures. And they were kind of like these giant uh, Malevich paintings. They were really kind of, um, they were really powerful in, in that they can stand there day and night you know, regardless of whether there is a human being tending to them, they capture this water and they so profoundly alter the environment that they're standing in. Um, and so I'm really intrigued by their ability to uh, very kind of quietly, stoically and, and powerfully enact a kind of political resistance with just their existence there. And when I saw them, they just seemed so much bigger than the whole of us. You know, they're very, very active. Um, and, you know, to use Aaron Manning's terms, they, they, they somehow seemed kind of like the epitome of what artfulness can be. And that's it. That's a wrap. <laughs> Is question time. Hello, Fran. <laughs> oh, my goodness. How exciting. What a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much. Um, and you provoke so many deep questions. I think it's fabulous. Uh, but I'm going to start with a question at the most recent point of your talk because that's easiest to remember for a little brain. Um, the fact is that this 
inscription on the bottom of that image, the last image was that this was designed by MIT yeah. uh, or MIT what, engineers. Um, researchers. Oh, okay, okay. Now, the, when you introduced the topic of the fog nets, I was thinking, aren't those Chileans remarkable that they could reclaim their community and preserve it and all that stuff. So it made me, when I saw that yeah. about MIT, I thought, well, how did that connection ever get made between them and this Chilean uh, ecosystem? So. So yes, I think that um, it's misleading perhaps because um, these fog catching nets were originally designed in Chile, but, but they, it's since grown. Uh, and so there are researchers all around the world looking into fog collection. There is a local contingent, local as in Canada. So there's, a, there's an organization by the name of Fog Quest and they work out of BC and they uh, send volunteers around the world to uh, build, help build, the or help the community build the netting. Um, but, so that's how, that's how this kind of stuff happens. There's like a world, um, there's a, a worldwide conference on, um, on water collection, cloud, cloud research, and then you know, people from these kinds of net research groups will, will go and present on that. So that's how those international connections get made. But the Pina Blanca people yes. themselves really did come up with this from the Yes, groups, yes, so inspiring. yes they did. And I should say that this location in Pina Blanca is also used as an <coughs> educational tool. And so there will be school, there are schools that visit from across that country to this location and they learn about water conservation and also different irrigation methods um, for farming. And this is a way to kind of ensure that generations see, uh, the future generations see land stewardship and farming, agriculture as actual um, potential avenues for livelihood. Yeah. Well, aside from all the political stuff and the environmental stuff, I mean, it makes you think how people can be empowered to, to do that reclamation where they live. And uh, we may all need these skills. Uh, if not already, we may need them eventually at where we live and breathe. And yep. I can see why you're so uh, <coughs> interested in this kind of thing as an artist because it has all the elements of art making. It's, uh, you know, it's got graphic qualities, it's got formal yeah. qualities, it's got exploration of material, plasticity of material, problem solving, choice making, you know, make the endless list. And why wouldn't an artist want to know about this stuff and be inspired by it? Could you write my artist statement? <laughs> Ron? The, the processes of all of these are so linked to textile. We're in a, yeah. a building that for decades had exhibitions of textile. Uh, tradition here in Cambridge of textile. Yeah. Yet uh, textile, that in my experience in university settings, is rarely acknowledged. Some of us say that's partly gendered, but it's also partly the division of art and craft. Yeah. Is there a reason why you don't make that link between the, there is that long, long tradition of textile that has functioned in pragmatic ways, as here, uh, in decorative ways, as costume, as keeping us warm, as the buildings we live in, the structures we live on and on and on. Do you look at that connection? Well, because some of your, you know, when you drape yep. essentially the, the netting over a support, yes. you made a kind of tent. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. You know, what I think maybe is happening is I, I used to work exclusively with textiles and so a lot of reclaimed fabric for, um, and I would make sculptures, use soft sculptures using fabric and textile. Um, and so I feel like I've kind of had the discussion with myself 
and I don't talk about it publicly anymore because I, it's sort of internalized. Um, and I don't really, I don't, I could very easily start to start making costumes or like I don't really see there being um, hard lines around or categories around um, the, the you know, textile world and, and other kinds of sculpture. And so I feel free to, to enter into you know, textile making just as I would maybe start to do chemical experiments in the studio. I don't, I, that, that's, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question at all. But. Okay, he let me off the hook. <laughs> Can you, give us a, can you give us a teaser of what you're thinking about now? Or like where you're bouncing between? Yeah, I am starting to think more about chemical experimentation. So actually working with somewhat safe chemistry to develop um, different kinds of uh, color patterning on paper. And I'm not sure where that's going to go but there's a lot of really interesting printmaking that can happen with chemistry. Um, and I'm also interested in now, now working with things like iron filings, um, uh, copper, copper point, silver point, things that will change over time. They will start to um, you know, oxidize and kind of transform their appearance over time. So rather than kind of waiting for things to fall over, I could actually, you know, work with materials that inherently have a fugitive quality to them. So that's what I'm thinking about, and I'm starting to experiment with things like that. It's just nowhere near a kind of presentation. Um, yeah, it's research, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think it can. I think it can. I think, um... If an object makes itself, does it become an art bird? Does it have to be an art I, I mean, I guess I, I, would love, I, would, I would love to say yes, it, an, an artwork can make itself, objects can make themselves, we might not be able to see them right away, um, maybe it, it's, it already happens in, with, with artwork that's in a gallery space, um, in a gallery proper white cube, and, and are they making themselves be, before our eyes? Um, yes, I think so, but it, you know, it depends on the way you want to talk about it so words words become incredibly important or with Trisha Donnelly that evasiveness becomes a huge part of the artwork making itself so so making sure you're not um, prescribing the reading all of a sudden opens up the work to um, much more than even the the physical thing standing in front of you so she's able to create like a narrative where people have the anticipation of something happening like a performance so people will talk murmuring murmuring at an opening that there is a performance something is happening there will be a sound piece there will be a horse that rides into the gallery space none of that happens but in everyone's mind it has happened and and the and the story goes on and and it ends up being this beautiful artwork that never occurred and so i don't know things it's possible doesn't that just describe the fact that it goes back to the humans? Like, yeah, an artwork might yeah. create itself, but it's only going to become an artwork because the human beings are going to perceive it as such. Totally. This is this is exactly that kind of that paradox, right? And that yeah. that that um, it's really uh, frustrating because if I'm talking about this kind of work, it's um, it's always seen through the eyes of, of the human being. Um, I mean, even, even saying, oh, imagine the perspective of a rock. Well, why would a rock have perspective? Why, we're already saying that a rock has human qualities by, by, by imagining what a rock imagines, right? So it's impossible to get outside of 
this body um, and that's what is so frustrating and I think that frustration and kind of that brick wall is very very productive because it's this impossibility that keeps me going back and it's like try try again imagine this imagine it this way say it that way what will happen and it's impossible so I just keep going yeah mm hmm Um, when you went to that residency uh, at the, um, the Canada, yes, um, and you decided to arrive without um, materials, had like what prompted you to make that decision? Or had you made that decision before um, doing that residency? Like, had you done it in a different context or, right. or situation? No, I don't think I had done that before. It was, um, I, I, I saw the residency as a chance to reinvent myself. And I thought that if I brought materials with me, I would, I would kind of already be saying what it was I was going to do and what kind of artist I was going to be. And so I wanted to pose, um, impose uh, strict limitations on the practice. So if I, um, it, the limitation was the location, it was like, let's see what, Pol what Poland does and what, what will be around there. And, and that way I'm not kind of predetermining the artwork I'm going to make. Because sometimes you can use a residency, right, to, you know you have to complete X amount of work for a show, and so you go and you just go and do that. And for me that wasn't the point of that. I wanted to be kind of influenced by my surroundings, or else I could just go to my basement or, or something, you know? So it was a chance to respond to unexpected circumstances. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I have one more question. Please. You referred to the context. What you referred to the context. Yeah. Now that you're, actually, I noted a distinct difference between your first solo at Waterloo and your first exhibition in a commercial context. Mm hmm. Have you considered that in a very conscious way? And what are you going to face into the future in that regard? Because there's, there, there is all the history, we've talked about this before, the history of similar practices or practices, concern, process. I used to think it was my generation, and then I got a little more deeply aware and was aware that there were black generations earlier. So the right. audience, okay. But then what about the commercial context? Many of us at certain times resist it and then don't. Yep. And then accept it. So is yep. that a factor in your investigation? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know, I try to turn my brain off and not think too much about about those kind of real world things, you know, like, okay, this is going to be in a commercial space in a different city, and um, I try to turn that part of my brain off, and it, it doesn't really work. I think that's where I have to, that's where I have a lot of growing to do, is um, making sure that the experimentation is at the forefront of of the work always um, and instead of responding to you know nonprofit uh, public museum commercial respond to the space architecturally you know, respond to the time period respond to the political climate uh, and, and, and try to muffle I think that, that that is a muscle that you can exercise and I think it's something that's I hope to acquire over time is to make sure that my focus is on some of the other things that I that I just mentioned rather than being kind of psyched out by by a particular audience. Yeah. Wow, thank you. You guys are so attentive. Mm -hmm.